Go ahead. A single repo up as a placeholder while some of the tooling discussions work their way out or uh, push the existing uh, three to four repos that we have in their current state. Um, and we're just working through some of the logistics on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> I just think that sooner <laughs> would be better than later. Um, but uh, Chris, yes, this is Patrick Holmes, um, formerly of Intel. Um, I I did send those requests and I copied you on them. So I sent requests to get a, a repo um, right. to um, to Mike and to uh, Philip uh, earlier earlier this week. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up. I think. Uh, it got uh, pushed to Andrew, so um, let me uh, see what we can do there in terms of expediting um, a, on, a proposal there. Okay. All right, Chris, uh, I see that Emmanuel joined. That brings us to 8 of 11, so we've reached quorum at this point uh, to proceed. All right, Dan, I guess I'll follow up with you and, and Andrew and, and see if we can make some progress. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. thanks. Yep. All right, thanks. Is Vitalik on? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Um, so we're at quorum, so uh, we'll call the meeting to order. Um, and uh, so the f first uh, topic is a presentation by Vitalik. Uh, on the Ethereum uh, technical stack and roadmap, and I think he's got a, a chart or two on some possible ideas about collaborating with Hyperledger. So, Vitalik, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, un unfortunately, I can't join through go to meet go uh, go to meeting because it uh, I think it either doesn't work for me or on Ubuntu and the internet connection is not not great. But for those who have the, sli the, the slides that I passed around by by email, uh, feel free to follow. Follow along. So, 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 wait, yeah. so uh, this is Andrew Keys. Should I have a be made and then I can show the slide? If you want if, to, sure. Yeah. So, if you bear with me for one second, I can uh, pull up the oh. actual slide. One second. Perfect. How are the uh, slides um, distributed? I don't see an email from anyone. It was a, it was a PDF that I uh, distributed to at least the people that were in the email thread with me, which probably isn't everyone. I'll, I'll post it in the Slack, guys. And, and Todd, if you can make sure to post that latter one, because that latter one has the Hyperledger uh, integration slide as well. I'll do. There were two sets of slides. Todd, are you going to post it? or? I'll get it posted to the list now if you post to Slack. Okay, I'll, I'll drop it in Slack. So, can everyone see? Uh, if... Yep. Okay, great. Okay. So, shall I start? Yes. Okay, so uh, on to slide two before Ethereum. So in general, when I uh, describe Ethereum, the thing I've actually found the most helpful is to start off essentially by describing the, the problem that I originally had in mind back when I first came up with um, most of the core ideas back in uh, November 2013. So this was the time when people were starting to realize that there were applications for blockchain technology going beyond just moving coins around, and people were coming up with protocols like Namecoin, Colored Coins. Um, I have a Swiss Army Knife protocols there. So what I mean, 
what I refer to by that is this idea that after things like covered coins, people started to realize that, you know, there might have been like five or 10 or 15 different blockchain applications that people might want to do. And so people would come up with protocols that had maybe 15 transaction types, one type for each application. So you'd have a specialized transaction type understood by the protocol entering into a financial contract with some, you know, specified leverage, some specified strike price or whatever. You'll have another transaction type for a different type of contract. You'll have another type of transaction for starting some kind of, for, for registering some kind of domain or some or what or some other entry and like for every single application you'd have some explicit support in the protocol for it so the problem with that approach is basically that it's insufficiently general so okay you have 15 applications now you create a protocol for these 15 applications what if someone creates an application number 16 then you know what do you do do you do you go back to the drawing board do you modify the protocol um, you know do you force everyone to switch to a different system, force everyone to upgrade. So it creates a lot of complexity. So uh, next slide. So the idea behind Ethereum was that instead of explicitly supporting some set of applications, we support a native programming language. So the um, at the bottom level, you can think of it as you know, something like, like C++, for example, doesn't have like any kind of special structs and keywords for trade finance or you know, financial settlement and clearing, but, you know, people still use it for those things because uh, it's those problems get solved, get solved on a much higher level. So Ethereum as a base layer, it tries to be as pure a kind of programming platform as possible. And the business logic for any application you might want to build can be implemented in this uh, programming language that's understood by the Ethereum protocol. So one of the ways that I sometimes explain the kind of abstraction is if you look at the role that transactions have in all these systems. So in Bitcoin, a transaction can do one thing. It can send X Bitcoins from A to B. In Namecoin, you, you have a couple of types of transactions. One of them is register domain X. Another one is if you own the domain X, you can set the IP address of domain X to Y. In Ethereum, it, it's essentially call, uh, kind of, well, roughly speaking, I'm kind of modeling together the low, low level and some of the higher level things here, but call function F of contract C with argument A. Now, of course, what exactly do these functions mean? What do the arguments represent? <clears throat> what kind of state does the contract store? All of that is basically up to each individual application. So next slide. So, so the, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. So just getting feedback. Okay. So the next slide is uh, I talk about the uh, Ethereum account model. So a lot of the time when uh, people talk about the EVM, what they uh, sometimes don't understand is that like the EVM is just it, it is a virtual machine. It does have you know, quite, a, quite a bit of functionality inside of it. But if you actually want the full be benefits of using Ethereum, then quite often you don't just want the EVM. You also want these other Ethereum components that, well, to some degree, feel kind of more like people don't often think about because they're because they're just there and there isn't really a a, a catchy name for it. And that's essentially the way that the way that accounts work, the way that a transact a transactions work as calls between accounts, the kinds of things that contracts can do, notion of code storage. Um, so, a lot of in general, if you see Ethereum application, there are Ethereum applications that are just one contract, and those contracts, you know, they require the EVM, and they also require this object called a contract, which actually keeps track of some notion of storage, which maintains some notion of state. So state could even be, you know, who either, it, it, could, it could mean a lot of different things. And in one of the later slides, I'll actually go into how people use contracts in lots of different ways. But the most interesting applications often even happen when you have many contracts that, are, that serve different roles and these contracts are talking to each other. So it's 
not just about the EVM, it's also about this kind of framework that exists around it that allows those, those, uh, those kinds of things to happen. So, in general, the way accounts work in Ethereum is there's two types of accounts right now. So I have a note there that, and I'll talk about this at the end, that in the future, um, we're actually going to move toward a one account type model. But right now, there's two types of accounts. One of them is in uh, what, what we call an externally owned account. And this is an account that's controlled by a private key. So what does control mean? Essentially, it means that if you have a private key, then you can create, create a transaction. If you digitally, or if you ECDSA sign that transaction with your private key, then if that transaction gets included in the block, it's interpreted as a message from that account with the value data, whatever, gas, whatever other parameters, you know, to whatever, whatever address the, tra the transaction is going to. So if you want to create a message going from one of these externally owned accounts to any other account, then the only way to do that is the transactions. Then the second type of account is a contract. So a contract is an account which is controlled by its own code. So in the, I'll jump between slides a bit. In the next slide, number five, I uh, talk about some of the parameters that transactions have. So this isn't a complete list. So transactions also have parameters around things like gas price, the ability to send ether, and uh, those other features. But the reason I'm omitting them is because I mean, first, in general, ether doesn't tend to be re very relevant to uh, private blockchain use cases. And uh, now there are some some situations where, like we've talked to some consortiums, where they uh, actually take essentially repurpose Ether in the protocol. So they might give you know individual users a budget that uh, that you know says you have the right to spend up to a billion computational steps a day. And sometimes they actually use Ether as a way to represent that. But that's not something that you have to do, and it's not really kind of critical to the model. So the parameters that are important are. Uh, First of all, the gas limit. So I'll talk more about this later, but one of the key innovations that the Ethereum virtual machine has is this notion of counting computational steps. So a transaction specifies the maximum number of computational steps that it can take. It specifies the destination address. It specifies data. And it sequence number and signature. So signature proof. If all, trans all transactions go from externally owned accounts. The signature determines which, ex e which EAO it goes from. And the sequence number is just there to prevent replay attacks. Now, a transaction could go theoretically to any account. So there's three types of destinations. One of them is an account that doesn't exist. The other is just another externally owned account. Those two cases aren't really interesting. and on the with the existing code, all 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 that does is it basically moves Ether around. But the most interesting case is if the destination address has code. So if a transaction goes to an address that has code, then the code runs, and the EVM is the thing that actually uh, inter interprets the code. So the code has the uh, ability to. Uh, I uh, do uh, quite a few things. Um, so the main ones are it has the ability to read and write the storage. So storage is a kind of key value database. Actually, talked about it on the previous slide too. It's a key value store. Right now, keys are 32 bytes, values are 32 bytes. But for efficiency reasons, uh, basically in order to kind of minimize the Merkle tree overhead, we're actually moving to 32 byte keys, unlimited size values in the future. And only the in every contract has its own storage, and only that contract has the ability to read its storage or write it write to its storage. Now, one important point from a security perspective is that just because, from the point of view of you know this sort of object-oriented model, we uh, only a contract can read its own code. That doesn't mean that you know outside entities. So just people reading the blockchain or you know running the code, running a full node, they all ha have the ability to see everything as well. So it's uh, so don't make the mistake that some people already have made of treating this idea that only contracts can re contracts can only read their own code as a privacy feature. It's it's basically more of a kind of object orientation um, 
what's the uh, what's the word like for information hiding uh, a hiding feature. So accounts have a 20 byte address, so every account has that address as a kind of identifier. Then, uh, so if you send a transaction to an account, the code runs, the code has the ability to read and write the storage. And the other thing that the code has the ability to do is they have the ability to send these things. We have a few different names for them. We sometimes call them subcalls. We sometimes call them internal transactions uh, to other accounts. So. The idea is that the, you know, these things look very similar to transactions. So if you know, I send a transact, I'm, I'm account A, I send a transaction to account B, then account B sends a, a transaction, uh, or then account B's code runs and it hits this opcode that sends you know, something to account C, then account C is going to see the exact same thing that if it saw if account B had actually been an externally owned account and if it had authorize that message with a transaction. So in general, we try to follow this principle that externally owned accounts and contracts have sort of the same privileges, the same ability to do things and interact with other accounts. Um, now, one pro property that these, inter these uh, internal calls have is that they uh, also provide a return value. So they're useful not just to command another account to do something, but also potentially to get information from a contract. Um, next slide. So accounts can be used for multiple functions. So what? So this is uh, in, so a lot of the time when people talk about the value of Ethereum and. Sorry, I didn't hear that well. I think that was someone's background. Yeah. Okay. Somebody just got Okay. Here. So, okay. So, accounts uh, can be used for multiple functions. So, when people talk, one of the things that people talk about regarding the advantages of Ethereum, and this is actually particularly true on the public chain, though I think on like private and consortium networks, that's uh, true to some extent as well, is this uh, notion of synergy. So. The idea is we try to make it very easy for different contracts that live on the same chain to interact with each other. And I have a few examples here of what these accounts can represent. So one example here is to specify an account, an access policy for an individual or organization. So in general, accounts are the kind of primary, identi primary identifier for both contracts and in general kind of actors inside the system. And so one thing that you could do is you could have, you know, some account that represents some organization and it might have that that account might actually be the account that either owns assets, has kind of relationships and some kind of in in contract, um, has the ability to you know, potentially you could even use this for as simple a use case as kind of crypto keeping track in the sort of cryptographically logged way of of uh, of resolutions signed by some, approved by some organization. So one thing that an account could do is it could specif specify an access policy. And the way that you would do this is you would do what we use what we call a forwarding contract. So the idea is you have a contract and that contract can accept proposed internal trans proposed internal transactions as mess. So in transaction data, that account can accept sort of proposals for operations that it can make. And in this case, I have a, an example policy where someone can create a proposal, and if that proposal spends, let's say, less than 100 coins per day, then any one of those keys can immediately um, uh, can make that proposal, and that proposal immediately gets executed. And what we mean by executed is that that account internally essentially forwards the message. So. Whoever proposed the message specifies the destination, specifies the data, specifies all the parameters, and a, uh, a call with those parameters gets created and sent by that account. But, so I have a, pol a, a policy here which is actually fairly complex in that it says any, up, any of one out of five are enough to send up to 100 coins a day, but if three out of five approve, then you have kind of unlimited freedom to do anything. So. The idea is this is like one example of a policy that you know some 
organization that holds assets on on an Ethereum system might have, but you ha you have in ex because this is all just written in programming code. You have an extreme degree of flexibility in terms of what kinds of policies you want to end up creating. Um, another one is uh, maintain a database of who owns how much of an asset and uh, process send operations. So this is uh, pretty similar to uh, use cases like you know covered coins and all these other blockchain-based asset issuance uh, uh, schemes. So the idea is that a contract keeps track of uh, who owns. Um, but basically, like you have a contract that actually represents some kind of blockchain-based asset, and contract storage is used to keep track of uh, how much, uh, uh, yeah, uh, or of how much each person has. So the key value map is basically a map of you know address to balance, and the contract has. Uh, if you send a uh, data to the contract, then it interprets that as a send operation and it you know, re reduces the sender's balance by some amount, increases the recipient's balance by some amount. So if you create the most naive version of this, like you, the, I, it, it basically, you know, as I've said, implements a kind of colored coin scheme in that you have these different actors and they uh, have uh, the, or you have this, uh, this contract and these different actors that all have balances inside of that contract and the contract itself sort of plays the role of being a, uh, Kind of token on, on on the network, but the nice thing about you know being fl extremely flexible and Turing complete is that if you have any kind of special needs, so for example the needs to restrict ownership to, you, to actors that have been verified in some way, or the needs to have balances that are you know non-transferable and so, for for some period of time or anything like that, then that's something logic that you can implement very transparently without affecting the uh, underlying interface. Then uh, we have uh, uh, another one is uh, for, for things for that accounts can be used for is uh, specifying an agreement between multiple parties to split the funds between them based on some conditions. So this is that, uh, this and the next one escrow is you know what people often talk about when you think about fun, uh, smart contracts but in general the the larger point I'm trying to make is that smart contracts actually have the ability to serve, or, or in general, blockchain-based code has the ability to support all of these other different functions. And uh, but it can do these next two, these next ones as well. So you can have a piece of code that says, if X happens, then send a message to this contract that represents this token and tell us to send 200 coins to this address. Otherwise, tell us to send 200 coins to this other address. Um, then a last, the, one of the last one use cases is the storing data that can be queried by other contracts. So one example is you might imagine some entity store, uh, could be a KYC provider or something similar that stores data information about, let's say, which accounts are went through some certain level of authorization and so there's uh, um, authorized users of uh, some uh, for some particular system. So now we get to the Ethereum virtual machine. So in general, the Ethereum virtual machine is a it is a virtual machine. The interface that it follows is uh, has a lot of parallels to other virtual machines. So in general, the inputs are pretty simple. It's code, data, and like it's. In, I also put environment variables there. Environment variables are actually technically external, though in some way you could consider them an input as well. You can kind of write the implementations to have them work both ways. And environment variables include things like the block number, timestamp, in Ethereum's case, uh, di mining difficulty, and a bunch of other variables. But theoretically, you can kind of hook this up to any of this, uh, you know, any kind of environmental data that you want contracts to be able to see. Then we have externs. So there's a few of them here. So there's like operations for reading and writing for re writing storage. There's making subcalls or internal transactions. There's uh, making logs. We won't have time to go into into logs too deeply, but you can think of it as a kind of easily verifiable proof of existence entry. So it's it, a log. It's it kind of gets stored on the blockchain, but it doesn't get stored in the state. So other future contracts can't actually read it. 
Now, theoretically, you know, you can many different virtual machines can kind of be modified and, and hooked up to this interface. So you can, if you really wanted to, you could use the Ethereum account model without the Ethereum virtual machine. So now the the next slide EVM requirements. So these are the requirements that we want yeah, hi, that we have. Sorry, can I ask you a question? Yes. So all the contracts run on their individual contracts run on their own EVM. Um. Okay, so, so there's only in one general on contract. Well, it depends on what you mean by one EVM versus multiple EVMs. Like there's one EVM protocol, right? Then in when a contract calls or when an account calls sends a transaction to a contract, that spins up an EVM execution instance, and if, you know, in the middle of that EVM execution instance, that contract decides, you know, it's going to send someone, uh, send a sub call to another contract, that spins up another execution instance. So you could also have kind of a stack of execution instances that um, if, uh, you're, if you have a series of uh, contracts that are, sending, that are sending calls to other contracts. Well, we have something similar over here, which are Docker images. So how fast is your spinning of these uh, EVMs? How fast can they, they spin? I, th I, think it's, I think it's very fast, though I haven't really made uh, the statistics yet. So okay, the EVM you. in general is, uh, design, is designed to be kind of extremely lightweight and uh, usable for this kind of turn it on, run it for 100 cycles, turn it off type of use case. Um, so EVM requirements. Uh, so this, so these are the very specific needs that we had when we were designing the Ethereum virtual machine. So we'll just go through these one by one. So first one is a small code size. So if you look at you know something like C++, even the simplest C++ program, if you try to compile it with default settings, can to something that's over four kilobytes. So and for computers, that's fine because, you know, we have gigabytes of storage and four kilobytes of inconvenience is so not even all that much. But on blockchains, you have contract code from potentially thousands or millions of users. Each one of them might have multiple contracts. And so space efficiency is really important. So basic contracts on the EVM, a lot of them have code which is less than 100 bytes. And so this is uh, one of the important requirements. The second one is that a virtual machine security has to be designed around running untrusted code from arbitrary parties. So this is fairly similar to the JavaScript use case, basically, you know, on the you know, public Ethereum network, which was the original use case, literally anyone can send code and everyone has to run that code regardless of, you know, who sent it. So if the person who sent it is a bad guy, then you have to make sure that the user VM is secure enough that you can't sort of escape the sandbox in some sense. Um, so, in general, I mean, we've accomplished this in, with a combination of strategies. I mean, so the EVM was designed from, the implementations that exist right now are designed from scratch. So they're, you know, you'll literally have code that interprets code, it process, you know, processes each individual opcode according to the way the spec says it says it should be processed. It's uh, here, what the EVM can do is extremely limited, and the only externs that it has are designed around things like uh, storage, logging, very small number of operations. It has no direct access to memory, for example. So you know, it talks to an object called memory, but memory itself is something that's kind of managed by the interpreter, and it's kind of an expansible byte array. Um, aside from that, look, so in general, small attack service are kind of being specific, explicitly designed for the task. We've gone through many security audits. Um, then the next point is uh, multiple implementations. So if, if you're, if, so Ethereum is. Uh, Everybody who's not talking. So Ethereum is fairly unique in that it has uh, about eight implementations of the protocol now, and most and uh, the majority of them are actually primarily you know maintained by the community. And we did this for a couple of reasons. One of them is just simple cross-checking. 
so when we issue when we initially created Ethereum and when we issue hard forks, generally we build tests and those tests are created by one client and then we make sure that all of the clients pass them. If even a single client doesn't pass them, then we figure out what, what, what went wrong and we try to fix the situation, make sure that it goes in, uh, make sure that it stays in consensus. Um, and the other reason why we did this uh, was to uh, mitigate developer centralization. And this was a concern for the public chain particularly because if you look, for example, at the situation with Bitcoin, you have kind of one development team that controls the code base that everyone uses. And this creates a uh, group which is, are, you know, even more centralized than, than the miners at this point. And that's something that we saw early on as a concern. And we, wa we wanted to take this other approach in order to mitigate it. So from a philosophical standpoint, we have multiple implementations. Also, Ethereum does have a formal specification, or well, I shouldn't use the I shouldn't use the word formal loosely. I suppose like it hasn't been formally verified or run by a computer, but we have a specific a specification that's called the yellow paper, which uh, describes in fairly mathematical language how every single piece of the Ethereum protocol works. And the idea is that like we don't really have the philosophy that you know that some other projects do that sort of the code is the spec in some sense. Like our approach is the yellow paper is the spec and it's up to and you know so in some cases even the yellow paper is wrong if the intent is clear is clearly wrong and it's up to the clients that implement the the protocol faithfully. So next requirement is uh, perfect determinism. So basically operations are have to the same inputs and you know the same external results have to always lead to the exact same outputs, and the reason is that this is running in the middle of a consensus architecture, so everyone has to precisely agree on everything, the results of every single call. Then the next one that we point that we have is uh, infinite loop resistance. So, you know, we don't want untrusted actors to be able to create code that just says you know while true and uh, do, do some expensive thing and just keep running forever. And the, now, a lot of languages have some notion of infinite loop resistance. So, you know, if you open up a web page and you have JavaScript that runs for a really long time and then the tab just crashes and these days it's fairly graceful. But in a consensus architecture, the loop resistance itself has to be accomplished perfectly deterministically. So decided from the start that timeouts aren't going to work. And, uh, this gets even more complex once you start talking about notions like, uh, you know, having subcalls, and then where each of those subcalls has its own get, has uh, has its own limit on how much computation it gets assigned. So, the uh, having perfect determinism at the VM layer is a very simple approach to solve all of those issues. So, next slide, I talk about uh, metering and gas. So, this is the uh, way that computation that we that we solve this problem in Ethereum. So the approximate idea is to count computational steps, but in reality, different operations have different gas costs, and these costs incorporate runtime, consumption of memory and storage, consumption of bandwidth, pollution of the bloom filter. Um, and the way that this works is that if a transaction or if a subcall, so if the code execution runs out of gas in the sense that you know it was assigned 40,000 gas and it burns, burns through all of it, then that operation is fully reverted, so it preserves atomicity. So if you write code, you don't have to worry about, you know, what happens if some attacker manages to execute only the first half of the code and not the second. But the gas is still treated as fully consumed, and that prevents denial of service attacks. Now, an important point here is that this transaction subcall stuff, stuff is on a, on a kind of per call level. So if you have a transaction that specifies a million gas, it can create a subcall to some address with, let's say, 40,000 gas. And if the subcall bursts through all the 40,000 gas, then the, sub, then the subcall gets reverted and it replies back with, uh, you know, instead of returning data, it returns kind of failure uh, code. But even the parent execution instance still continues running. So contracts, when they send messages to other contracts, they do not have to sort of trust those contracts. Um, Question? Yes. Does this model work differently in uh, private chains where you might not have, have the same economics with Ether? 
Um, okay, so a, this is a good, a, actually a good point because this is a question that a lot of people raise, is that the notion of gas is not dependent at all on the notion of ether, right? So gas is purely a metering technique. So the way that this works on the public chain is that a transaction says, you know, I have a million ether, or sorry, I have, uh, I'm willing to spend up to a million gas, and I'm willing to, to, to pay, you know, 0 0.00005 ether per gas for that, and then the miner, it's up to the miner to include or not include that transaction. But first of all, once it's established that the transaction is included, then you know within within the actual account model execution environment virtual machine, the gas is like there is no real sort of link between gas and ether. And in a private chain, you can imagine like I. It depends on the use case. So sometimes you might have contracts that are run by trusted actors and you might not care that much, but sometimes you might want you know, users to be able to provide custom code, in which case uh, you're going to want some notion of metering, but, and you also are going to, you do, but you do not need to use Ether as a way of economically rationing that metering. So. As an analogy, I would think of, think of the gas limits in Ethereum as being kind of like bytes of transaction space in Bitcoin, right? So in Bitcoin, every transaction consumes a certain number of bytes, and you know there's a byte limit of you know one million bytes per block. So in Ethereum, they, like think of gas and the gas limits as playing a, a similar role to that. Um, so in private chains, what you would do is uh, I mean, there's a few different techniques, right? One technique is you could say anyone can send as many transactions as they want, but every transaction can only have a gas limit of, let's say, 500,000. Another technique is you actually assign people credit, so you say, you know, you have the right to run a billion gas per day. And yeah. if that's what you want to do, then the simplest approach to doing that is actually to just piggybacking off of Ether. So in your private chain, you would still kind of use Ether, but you would have a, con a contract that sort of centrally assigns everyone, you know, a billion Ether a day, and you specify that you only accept the gas rate of, uh, of one Ether per gas. And that could be a very reason a reasonable way of uh, allocating uh, computational resources and transaction sending you know, uh, and preventing you know, transac transaction overuse. And, and and also, I'd, there's also a, a modality where we can have basically modularizable M of N round robin uh, for, for private implementations as well. So so basically, yeah, actually, you know, I'm, uh, oh, go ahead. Continue. Tell you. Yeah, sorry. So I think Andrew was just starting to talk about uh, consensus algorithms. So this was brought up on the previous call that uh, or a call we had just with just a couple of people earlier, but. I am deliberately focusing this presentation on the Ethereum virtual machine and the account model because those are the components that I think that the Hyperledger project is most likely to find interesting. But in general, we're start, we're moving in a direction of modularity, and so even though you know public chain mainline Ethereum uses its own particular brand of proof of, proof of work, chances are like even the groups that are looking at using consortium chain Ethereum right now, they're generally swapping that out with like round robin consensus, some PBFT or, you know, whatever other algorithm. So I'm going to jump to slide 10, pre-compiles. So the idea with pre-compiles is that some cryptographic operations are too slow to be done on the Ethereum virtual machine. So in general, the EVM does have some inefficiencies, but those inefficiencies are completely fine for you know, fairly simple operations where all you're doing is you're just dividing, subtracting, sending, a trans sending subcalls around. But if you look at things, if you want to do inside the EVM things like elliptic curve signature verification, hash verification, ripe MD160, and then what we do is we essentially provide native versions, and the way that you can call those native, natively implemented versions is by calling accounts at pre-specified addresses. So if a contract makes a call or makes a sub call to account one, then the, in the data of that sub could specify, you know, an elliptic curve signature, and the message would reply back with either zero if the elliptic curve signature failed, or the address, or basically like the, essentially the hash of the public key if the 
if if it was able to successfully just recover the public key from the signature. SHA-256, you send a data replies back with a SHA-256 of it. Right, MD-160, same thing. Um, number four, the sort of identity. So identi this is identity in the mathematical sense, not in the kind of standard blockchain sense. So you send data, it sort of sends you the same data back. And the only reason this exists is to facilitate efficient data copying. So in general, the uh, idea here is, is that if you're going to have a uh, private, you know, private or consortium chain, then depending on the use case, there might be some other computationally intensive operations that you might have. So I was talking to a firm in London, for example, that was doing financial derivatives and, on a, and they were starting to build a consor consortium a CRM chain. And they had needs around, they actually wanted to use a third party library to do things like computing the valuations of, you know, of like leveraged financial contracts in order to in, in order to you know pro figure out whether or not you need to do a forced liquidation event or figure out how much money that each each party gets, and these calculations were fairly mathematical mathematically complex. They would be too either too difficult or too much effort to implement in EVM proper. So instead, they're probably going to be a, a sort of extending the pre-compile set of of you know the that's used in the Ethereum public chain, adding their own pre-compile pre-compile address where you can call it and it replies back with the results from computing a function that's actually implemented in, in this library in Java. Um, so there is uh, a, uh, Vitalika, a quick, yes. quick question here. Um, on, within the EVM, I believe that you have a, uh, an operation called EC Recover. Is, yes. So that's, does that, okay, so yeah. how, Okay, so EC recover is not an opcode. EC recover is a precompile, right? Okay. So, right. so right. So opcodes are things where you know it's like a specific byte in the code, and if the code runs over that, then it does it. And SHA three, for example, it actually is an opcode. But if you want to do EC recover, then what that actually compiles down to is basically a call to address one. Okay, so it has all the efficiency of a. Uh of native yeah. execution. Exactly. Right, great. Thank you. Ex right. Yeah. Um, so next slide is the uh, ABI. So this is so when I get uh, near the beginning of the presentation, when I described Ethereum contracts as being about function calling, I was uh, so theoretically uh, that's on the on the very bottom level. That's not really true because there is no concept of functions. All there is is just there is. There are contracts; they have code, and you can send these into subcalls to them that have data. But a lot of, in practice, most contracts have multiple functions that you might want to call. So these functions might, if you have something like some kind of registry, then you might have you want to register a key, set the value associated with a key. If you have a currency, then you might have send, but you might also have methods like uh, creating, a, like there's creating a creating what we call a check and there's kind of specialized cases where there's sort of different kinds of sending that you want to do in the case of uh, a financial contract or even like, even like a blockchain based order book you might have a function for creating an order book, for creating an order a function for filling an order so the way that we meet this need is through this ABI so the idea is that the way that calling gets compiled down is that it, the first four bytes of the data to the sub call are like a function identifier. So four bytes that get sort of randomly generated from the hash of uh, the of the function parameters, or sorry, of the of the function like signature. And then the remaining data represents arguments in some standardized serialized format. So the serialized format is uh, if we're talking about static sized arguments, then it's very simple. It's just 32 bytes for each argument. So you know if, if you're doing something like like send then the usually send would have exactly 68 bytes in it, where the first four bytes are the identifier, the next 32 bytes are the destination address, the next 32 bytes are the value. If we start talking about, you know, including structs, including like dyna uh, dynamically sized arrays, including dynamically sized arrays of dynamically sized arrays and byte arrays, then the ABI kind of becomes slightly more complex. But in general, it's, it's still fairly, uh, 
straightforward. It's designed around this model of kind of 32 byte chunks. Um, then next slide, so high level languages. So obviously developers don't want to program in raw EVM assembly. And so, you know, developers are going to write code in higher level languages instead, and the compiler compiles it down to EVM code. So the yeah, higher level languages, they include Serpent, LLL, the most popular one, and the one with the most development effort right now is Solidity. And there is active research going on regarding uh, how, how to continue moving forward HLLs. So we are starting to do work on implementing formal verification in Solidity. Um, future ideas that I've seen raised by different groups. Unfortunately, there hasn't been much action on them yet, but I, I actually think there, it, this will start in the next few months. Total, total functional high-level languages, plain old functional high-level languages, domain-specific languages. Like one idea I heard was like a financial DSL that focuses on flows as a kind of fundamental unit. So there's a lot of opportunity in the kind of designing different languages that can pile down to EVM code. And uh, that's an ecosystem that we're quite happy to uh, support and consider um, and help along. Um, just to finish, I'll probably do this integration opportunity slide last, so just to move a bit to future development. So this is part of our road, part of our roadmap, probably the part of our roadmap that's relevant because for, for you guys, because something like Casper, the proof of stake algorithm might be less, less relevant for you. Although I will say that there actually are some consortium groups that like Casper and, and they and they're interested in using essentially a version of it where kind of every member every member of the consortium is assigned one coin, and the reason is that they they like the kind the kinds of trade offs that it makes between efficiency and finality. So there might be more more that might be even more useful than you than you might think at first glance. So if in general, future development. One of them is to merge the two account types, so there would be just one account. And the way this would work in practice is that for the protocol would no longer really understand the concept of a signature. Instead, every transaction would start off with an initial call from some sort of standard entry point address. And we're thinking for that address, it would be like 2 to the 160 minus 1, so like the highest possible address. And then, obviously, users want to you know, have accounts that are protected by private keys. But in general, all of this will be done with contracts. So like every account will be a forwarding contract. The contract code would specify kind of an account access policy. So it would be a for, you know, work fairly similar to the way that I, the multi-sig example that I described a bit earlier, though in most cases it will be a bit simpler. Then we, t I, so this is nice for a few reasons. Like it allows for like in a, more innovation in how access policies work. It lets people seamlessly move to other cryptographic algorithms. So one very practical use case is, let's say, if uh, you know, at some point people decide to move to you know ED25519 or WAM port signatures or whatever, then we we want to set things up so that we don't have to coordinate that move ourselves. People can just do it on their own. So you know, if you're paranoid about the NSA this year, then you can move your accounts to WAM port pretty much as soon as you want. At least once we get this feature rolled out. The next part is sharding. So sharding is how we accomplish parallelizability. So the full vision of sharding is designed around the public chain. So this is the idea of being able to support potentially millions of transactions a second or, you know, in, in the initial versions, probably thousands to tens of thousands, even if every single node in the network is just a laptop. And the way we do that is that assuming you know, in general, if there is that high, a that high a load on the Ethereum network, then it's going to be because there's a lot of computers on it. So instead of requiring every single validator to verify everything about every block, we kind of randomly assign blocks to different validators, and it gets processed in parallel. But that vision is for the public chain. I think the important note is that in consortium chain use cases, you can just require nodes to have, you know, powerful CPUs and like lots of cores, a lot of be connected to you know lots of memory, so you don't really need to do that kind of cross node sharding. And there's a, a much weaker version of sharding that gives you the same levels of scalability. So the idea here is that we kind of restrict the effects of transactions to particular address ranges, and this allows you to statically prove that particular transactions are disjoint, and so they can be processed in parallel. And then we talked. 
if you want to perform some operation that has effects across multiple shards, then you, we do what we call a, well, an, an, basically an asynchronous call. So the idea is you create, you have a one transaction on one shard, which creates what we call a receipt, and then another transaction on another shard, which verifies the receipt from the first shard. So you actually have to sort of take the receipt from the first shard, kind of include it in transaction data going into the, into the other shard. And then based off of that, you do your computation on the other shard. So it, that creates an asynchronous programming model, but the benefit is that it gives you, you know, it gives you parallelizability. So this is some, these changes are, you know, relevant because if you want to build Ethereum-based, like scalable Ethereum-based applications, then this, you're going to want to kind of work around this model, but this is fairly long term. Then the third one is increasing efficiency by implementing. Okay, then uh, the, the next one is uh, increasing efficiency by uh, implementing cryptography on top of the EVM. So we have two different paths here. So one of them, well, actually three different paths. Somebody who's, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but somebody on the phone okay. is on mute me. and it's Okay, so we actually have three paths. So I only mentioned two of them in the slides, but one of them is just making the EVM more efficient generally. The other one, which you know, our developers are working on, the other one is adding additional pre-compiles. So I talk about like EC ball and EC add are two operations that you would need in order to make, let's say efficiently implement ring signatures on Ethereum. Um, then if you want to verify RSA, and one of the use cases we've had for RSA is actually we want to be able to verify any just standard form certificates that are like the kinds that are used in like mainstream identity applications that already exist, you know, outside blockchain lands right now. Um, anything to do with like internet security. So we're in, like we're considering the idea of adding precompiles for basically big integer math. So adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, arbitrarily sized integers. Then. We also have a, a, a one person who's working on uh, an experimental architecture. So this is kind of like an EVM 2.0. So if we go this route, you know, we are we are going to have a fairly seamless upgrade path where you'll be able to kind of compile the old the you know EVM 1.0 into EVM 2.0. But the idea is it takes WebAssembly as a kind of base and takes WebAssembly code and actually adds uses a kind of trans compiler to add metering features, to, metering to it. So, you know, you would take a piece of code that has a piece of code, then just before every branch condition, you would, you know, reduce the amount of gas remaining by some amount. And if the gas, if gas is zero, then you would, you know, hit an exception. So this is still in fairly early proof of concept stage. It's one of the things that we're looking at. The other thing that we're looking at is this more iterative approach of just continuing to sort of hammer at EVM roughly at exi as it exists today introducing efficiency features for, you know, things like different sizes of integers. Um, but, you know, in general, with a goal of increasing efficiency to the point where you ideally should be able to implement any kind of cryptography on top of the EVM in, you know, very reasonable speeds. So the last slide is, uh, well, the slide before that, 13, integration opportunities for Hyperledger. So this is... Um, Probably the area where I know a bit less about, and we probably, you know, if we wanted to go more deeply into this, we probably need some, probably even more, even more follow-up calls. I need more information about specifically the kinds of things that hyper, the 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 ways that certain like the arch the architecture works at this point. But you know, in general, there's a few paths. So one of them is that you could look at just the EVM. So you could keep the way that you're doing things exactly the same right now, reg with regards to you know the account model. But you provide the EVM as an option, essentially, you know, I think as what you were calling chain code. So if people want to, in, you know, create, enter into agreements that are mediated by, you know, some piece of EVM code, then you offer them the ability to do that. But then the, one of the challenges is uh, that you have to figure out, you know, are we, are you looking at the EVM as just a kind of stateless thing? Do you like, are you do you want to map it to some notion of storage? Do you want to map it to some? You know, do you want, 
or even going to try to support you know any notion of internal transactions or subcalls. Another approach is to try to integrate both the account model and the EVM. So try to, or the third option that I offer there is kind of work on an account model that tries to, you know, take the desired properties that the EVM has at this point and uh, try to add on, or try to come up with some architecture that essentially uh, satisfies the requirements satisfies all the same properties, so the abilities for contracts to call each other, the ability for, uh, like, the notion that everything, that you have these kind of long-term persistent objects that have identifiable addresses, and uh, see if there's some way to integrate that so that we get, you, you, we, you uh, do not need, yeah, so that, you know, all this sort of cross-contract calling can actually happen. So the other yeah, you know, the other pieces of Ethereum, so you know, things like the consensus algorithm and the network layer you're probably less less interested in, which is why, you know, I actually I was trying to personal machine and the account model for this presentation. Um so but in general I would say that this is sort of stuff where we'd probably uh, needs to take some some time and I would need to take some yeah. time in understanding more of what you're doing in order to figure out the best approach. So, so Vitalik, if, if, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think yeah. kind of the, the public Ethereum network could be like the next generation of the internet kind of using blockchain technologies, mm -hmm. it, 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 of these three options, would uh, what I'm looking for, and I think the optimal path for Hyperledger is the ability to integrate, you know, private consortiums and private mm -hmm. infrastructures, and have the ability to interact eventually with the public ledger, similar to how intranets okay. work with the internet. What do you think the path of least resistance? Okay, so. So in general, I think that as Ethereum does goes in, particularly goes into the scalability direction, and we start talking about things like sharding, that so sharding in itself, like cross shard operations, like they require a lot of very similar kinds of considerations, infrastructure to cross chain operations, and so I think over the next couple of years, we're probably going to inevitably we're going to move to a model where the developer tools around cross anything operations are going to be kind of fairly smooth and easy to use in a lot of different ways. So there's, and there's also actually multiple directions that we're kind of attacking this. So one of them is sharding. The other one is that consensus sort of uh, working on that DTC relay, which is kind of a way for Ethereum contracts to read the Bitcoin blockchain, and there is infrastructure being built around that. So a, uh, a possibility would be to kind of follow along with the progress on both of those, and uh, then, you know, like one could like one could imagine a kind of standard, some kind of standardized software that's like consortium chain relay, and like one thing you you know you, you could do is you could even just for some regular consortium chain, regardless of how it works, then you we could imagine a kind of consortium chain relay package where you would have on the Ethereum blockchain you would have the ability to verify the signatures of you know whatever validators were in the consortium network. And so that if you create an, a tra some transaction or some log or some state entry in the consortium chain, then the, then the public chain can verify it. And then if you integrate the EVM and the account model in the consortium chain, then the other thing that you could do is you can actually do have the relay run, work in reverse. So you can have a relay, uh, a relay where the consor operations for Ethereum contract in the consortium chain can essentially read proofs that some particular thing happens on the public chain. So once you have both of those, then you basically have a complete sort of asynchronous programming model where you can just write applications that, you know, look like promises, JavaScript, callback towers, whatever, and they, and they compile down some things that work across, you know, multiple blockchains. Right. So, so, so this is Chris. So, so thanks for this. This has been, I think, really um, informative. And I, I kind of like the <clears throat> the thinking on this on this last about you know some of the ideas that we might uh, pursue to move forward. I think uh, you know certainly you know if you look at them from a progressive perspective, you know the first stage would be to get the UB I'm sorry the EBM uh, somehow rather mm -hmm. integrated. What we're doing in Hyperledger, 
and and you know then we could probably explore you know what would take to get the account model to achieve you know some of the things you were just discussing. Mm -hmm. But uh, so so Andrew, you know we're having the hackathon uh, next week, uh, Thursday and Friday in in New York. I'm wondering is uh, you know is there any possibility that we might be able to sort of do a little bit of experimentation uh, during that hackathon to see if we can't. Absolutely. Um, Vitalik, how long, so, so I know that Vitalik speaking at consensus, um, obviously the consensus with a Y personnel, we're here in New York and resident. Um, we're ready, willing, and able to, to help this type of integration um, as you see fit. Vitalik, what are your thoughts? Um, and, and what's your ability? Yeah, so regarding me being there in person, I'm going to be at consensus with a U, and uh, I'm, uh, so, Maybe even suggest dates, and we'll see if I can come in person, whether it's to the hackathon or so, or or something else. Um, the, aside from that particular week, then you know, I think if so, in general, you know, Ethereum Foundation is quite busy on research, development, core. So, look, we're not going to be able to you know contribute full time full time developers to this. But if you know between yourselves, we can send the sister. Figure something out, then I'll be happy to you know have kind of more more of these discussions and uh, pr help provide guidance on uh, the the best way to move forward on any of these. Okay, and Chris, uh, Chris, you and I can speak offline. I, I, we have a few developers at Consensus with a Y that could probably help with it with this uh, endeavor. Okay, super. Thanks, Andrew. So this is like I said. Thank you very much. Um, this was a, a great talk, and I know I. Certainly enjoyed it, and uh, based on some of the discussion in the chat, it seemed like others were engaged as well. So um, I think this is this is very good. So thanks. Are, are there um, any questions for Vitalik? Or is it, should we open it up for any questions? Um, or not? So, uh, um, we are having an architecture work group uh, meeting on uh, Friday a.m. next week. Uh, if Vitalik yeah. is available, if he can kind of join yeah. and. Uh, um, participate in that. One of the topics we have teed up is, uh, yeah. you know, how we evolve the architecture going forward. Um, okay. So, um, you're available. Yeah, I would, you. I would say send me an email with, with the time and I'll see if I can participate. I am fairly busy with meetings and conference stuff the next, the, the next couple of weeks, but, you know, the, the, the earlier you tell me, then the, the, more, the more flexible I'm able to be and the earlier I can tell you if I can make it. Cool, and, and we also Sounds have some good. developers that are that are in, that'll be in New York that could go in his steed that, that may not know the exact uh, breadth, but 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 could step in. Uh, okay, least. super. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate it. All right, so let's um, move on. So actually, um, I think we'll probably dispense with the work group updates because um, uh, there's not a lot of time, and I know that there's concern about um, some um, of this. By the way, is there anything? Uh, Sorry, is there anything else that you need myself for? Or uh... Uh, no, but we'd love to have you next week at the hackathon to help okay, with perfect. Uh, somebody. Okay, sharing. perfect. So I'm gonna yeah. drop off now, and you know, feel free to send more information about any of that just to my email. All right. Thanks. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. So. Um, uh... <clears throat> Again, I think we'll dispense with the with the updates. <clears throat> uh, we can take care of that. Uh, I think next week. Um, so very quickly, from an action item review, um, uh, the TSC representation policy draft. I haven't had a chance to do that, uh, but I uh, I will try and get that done before next week. Um, finalize the technical face-to-face -face state and venue, and uh, that was done. Thank you, Todd, and thank you to DTCC. Um, for those of you who haven't registered and are planning on attending, uh, it sounds like it's going to be uh, potentially very exciting with, you know, the possibility that we may do some exploration of integrating uh, the EVM with Hyperledger's uh, Fabric and or Sawtooth Lake. Uh, again, I, I think there's a number of different uh, paths that we could take there. Um, <clears throat> uh, the white paper draft, um, Dave, I'm assuming that's still on track for next week. 
Well, I didn't promise it next week, and I'm not promising it for next week. We are aiming to have at the start of next Wednesday, next Wednesday's meeting what we think is the first draft. We're going to go all the way through it, and if we're happy with it, then it will be available. But if, okay. if, yeah, but it's it's not promised. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. okay. Um, uh, set up the Sawtooth Lake. We talked about that earlier. Uh, connect Patrick with Rye. That's uh, with the same thing. Uh, create the Fabric API repo. Uh, Tomas, that's uh, still TBD, but I think you you're you're going to have that in time for next week's hackathon. Is that right? Well, we do uh, our best we... to work on this, but this is uh, really a, uh, a split of an existing repo that we use in our development internally. And uh, it's quite disruptive to our internal processes. Uh, therefore, it took a bit longer than I anticipated. But we are working on it, and uh, hopefully, we'll get done until that. Okay. And then, last but not least, thanks to Moss. Uh, last but not least, we were going to try and set up some time to discuss the exit criteria. Um, I think, and, and again, I think the best thing to do would be as we're together next week. Hopefully, there will be enough of us that could get together and start discussing it face to face, um, and we'll try and fit that in um, uh, as we can. So let's get into the to the planning. So you know, again, I think that the, you know the plan for the face to face would be very similar to what we had uh, the last time. In other words, I think that there will be you know sort of steady state of hacking on various experiments and. Uh, you know, I think the, the EVM uh, experimentation is uh, potentially a good idea. Um, I'm planning on uh, chatting behind the scenes with uh, Dan on, you know, what can we potentially hack on between Sawtooth Lake and the fabric. Um, and then, you know, again, uh, Dan, if, if you have any specific ideas for um, uh, for, for, for Sawtooth Lake, you know, again, from a technical perspective, um, be certainly interested in, in hearing about those and getting them, um, uh, you know, getting people prepared for uh, any of those hacks. Um, and then there's still, I think, a little bit of work to be done on the integration of uh, the DH code and, the, you know, the, the repository that they're going to be setting up the Fabric API and the Fabric. And then there's, uh, I think, also going to be plenty of opportunity to hack on uh, the infrastructure. There's, um, you know, some bots that we could set up to integrate Slack and Git and so forth. Um, uh, I've been playing around with that, but I think, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting to, to start doing uh, some of that work. And then potentially um, we could also think about uh, starting some of the transition uh, from uh, Travis to Jenkins. So, so those are the, some of the thoughts that I had for the face-to-face, -face, but um, uh, there's also then the work groups. Um, so there's the requirements, the white paper, and identity and architecture work groups. And so maybe we could just spend a few minutes here trying to figure out when the right timing for these would be so that we can avoid um, uh, any, any, any potential conflicts. So uh, I think uh, Christopher, you were trying to get Thursday, I think, for the identity. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, we had a few people that could only Chris, make it Christopher, on you're, 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 Christopher, you're very, very thin. At least you are for me, anyway. Uh, we only had, uh, uh, we had some people who could not make it on Friday when we did our doodle poll. So we had requested uh, uh, that time. And then when we talked uh, yesterday with the architecture, uh, you know, a more casual poll said that they would uh, prefer Friday. Um, and that didn't, the, the topic of which day would be better wasn't brought up at the requirements working group. Okay, so, so Patrick, what um, were your thinking, what was your thinking for the requirements? Is Patrick still on? Oh, I think he had to leave. Um, I will follow up with Patrick. Um, so this is Ram. Um, we, we were thinking of uh, Friday a.m. Uh, okay. for the architecture work, working group. Okay. 
All right. So if That's Patrick uh, is able to do Thursday AM, then uh, we won't because there's a little bit of overlap between the requirements uh, working group and our working group. Maybe maybe not too much, but uh, so we could figure okay. that out. And 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 Dave, what about what about you and the requirement and the uh, white paper? Rather, was there? Yeah, uh, we didn't actually uh, talk about it. Um, we we're just, I kind of uh, lost track. I guess uh, Wednesday is our, our typical meeting. But I'm sorry, are we are we talking about doing a presentation to the to the group? Um, no, we have. Like when, you know, are you going to to want to sort of spend breakout time with the the faith the white paper working group, or you know, were you going to not plan on on actually working on the white paper during the face to face? Yeah. So, well, um, I'm going to reach out to the members and just find out who's available for next Wednesday, and and if not because of consensus, then we'll reschedule. And if Friday looks to be the better of the two days, then um, we'll do that. But we we didn't actually get a chance to organize that. Okay. Well, um, I think since Patrick is not here, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, I I think Chris, I think you know. Having the identity on Thursday, are you going to need all day Thursday? Is that the thinking? Christopher? Christopher? No, yeah, no, we don't need. I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, give us a, uh, an hour and a half, two hours, and, and we'll do great. Um, okay. We just thought it would be really useful to have a, a specific amount. I mean, I was thinking, you know, uh, 11 to 12:30, or or something like that, and and we can, you know, if if there was a room that also had a uh, uh, a conference call phone, um, we might be able to include some of the people who couldn't make the actual uh, face to face. Um, is yeah, so I'm not sure. I, I I suspect that we're going to be in the same place we had the original face to face in January. Um, uh, Todd, is that correct? Yeah, it's very similar space. They may be able to partition off um, a section of it. I'll just check in with our events team and okay. get an answer there. Yeah, it's that's... not it's, it's not vital. Um, it was okay. it was just a, a possibility. I, but there's eleven people from Identity uh, Doodle out of uh, you know thirty some odd total who said, "Yeah, we're going to be there, and we want to talk about um, Identity." So, okay, all right, that sounds good. Um, so maybe um, you, you said you wanted two hours, ten thirty to twelve thirty, um, and uh, and then uh, that would work. To... And Rom, you wanted the the mornings so at nine to, to to noon, or is that what you were thinking? Yeah, that that would that would work great. Um, nine to noon, uh, and again, if we have a call in, it'll be great. But that's uh, optional. Okay, and then if there's any overlap with requirements, they can uh, they can be working on the afternoon of Thursday, and uh, uh, and hopefully that will be um, effective enough to break out. So I'll I'll sketch that out and I'll send it around, and if we hear any yelling and screaming, we can we can adjust it on uh, on the on Slack or on the mailing list. Um, uh, so we do have actually a few minutes left. Ed, um, so, so actually, uh, Dan, is there any? Um, I mean, have you guys given any thought to any hacks and you know any explorations that you might want to, um, you know, offer up uh, for Sawtooth Lake? Yeah. So we hadn't previously considered um, some of the stuff that came up from uh, from the Ethereum talk today, but we had independently been looking at uh, some projects that could be done there. So why don't I circle back with my team and uh, maybe I can uh, sync up with you uh, tomorrow on that. Uh, tomorrow I'm traveling but I, I can probably slack or something in the um, uh, in the morning, in the late morning. Um, okay, well one way or another uh, we can connect on that and uh, I can otherwise yeah. circulate stuff generally on, on the, some of the slack channels. Okay, awesome. And uh, you know, any anyone who has an idea for an experiment, you know, that they might want to uh, try out, you know, if they're going to be there and they want to, you know, get a few people to work with them on something, I think it would be, uh, I think it would be interesting to to see some of these uh, organically uh, happen as well. I think actually the 
one of my colleagues had been exploring the last time on um, standing up the the fabric infrastructure using Ansible, and I think she said that um, she may be continuing some of that work. Um, so there's that's a that's a possibility as well. Um, so I think we have a few uh, ideas on tap, and again, you know, from from my perspective, I think the most important thing coming out of the hackathon is going to be. Um, uh, you know, even more collaboration. I, I, you know, I've been watching very closely in the, um, you know, in the pull requests and the issues and the conversations and so forth. And and it's, you know, I think there's there's definitely a steady trend towards increased collaboration. There's you know pull requests coming in from um, a number of people uh, that are not IBM, and that's a good thing because again, that's that's the goal here is to uh, you know, create a, 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 a true community initiative uh, out of this. Um, and, uh, you know, I think hopefully once we get Sawtooth Lake um, up and running, you know, we can start seeing collaboration there as well and potentially and hopefully collaboration between and across Sawtooth Lake and Fabric um, as we go forward. Um, so any... Did it, was somebody speaking or trying to speak? Uh, I was just affirming what you were saying at the end. Oh, okay. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, all right. So we have about five minutes left. Uh, we could... Um, Patrick's not here. Um, I don't know. Chris and, 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 you know, David's already basically given his update. We do have a few minutes left. Uh, Ron, do you want to give a brief update on Architecture. Uh, yes. Uh, so um, we met on Wednesday. Um, most of the discussion was around, um, you know, the, the consensus uh, layer, if you will, and how uh, it would be uh, the requirements for how to isolate that and make it uh, truly modular and uh, independent of the business logic layer. Um, and we also discussed briefly on uh, the other issues that we want to tackle. So the plan um, uh, is uh, for the next meeting um, to kind of go over both uh, the uh, um, API for that function as well as the functional definition um, of what happens in the consensus. Um, so that's the, the, uh, the immediate topic, uh, or particular topic that we want to kind of uh, address. Uh, so the overall plan is to, to wait to, to have these kind of one-off topics uh, to explore and as soon as the requirements uh, use cases and requirements are mature, then we will go down the path of uh, a formal uh, architecture of functional decomposition. Okay, that's wrong. And, uh, and then finally, Christopher, do you have an update from uh, Identity? Um, no, we didn't meet. Le we're only meeting every other week and uh, uh, the main thing at the last meeting was that we plan to, to meet face to face rather than doing a, a call. Oh, next okay. Week. So. All right, fair enough. Uh, I can... and, and what are the time? What are the times and dates of that face to face meeting for for uh, my identity folk? I mean, the face to face is at the uh, at the, uh, the 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 hyperledger face to face. On uh, and and we requested Thursday. Yeah, that'll be Thursday at what morning. time? Ten thirty to twelve thirty. Ten thirty to twelve thirty, and the location. I'm just relaying this information for one of my. Uh, this will be at the, at the at the hackathon at the face to face at DTCC. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, and and Andrew, actually, the, the, there's a calendar in, in terms of the the biweekly or weekly meetings for some of the various work groups. There's a calendar off the wiki um, with with all of the uh, all the meetings posted. Um, Thank you. And uh, and I can give a brief update on the CI. Um, uh, so we had a call with um, uh, the the Linux Foundation's uh, release and in integration release engineering team. Um, and we went through and I tried to capture most of the conversation uh, highlights in, in Slack, but, but, uh, and, and that's in the CI 
uh, pipeline channel if you're interested. Uh, but the, the basics were uh, sort of as follows. You know, we, um, uh, you know, again, I think we have a, 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 a I think I think that the the quality and the security of what we're developing here is is of paramount importance uh, for for the project, and so I think we we will you know and and it was pretty clear you know talking with um, uh, you know with Andrew and the team that. Um, it, we were probably going to want to be using Garrett to manage the review process itself. It gives us a lot more rigor around establishing uh, certain criteria before you actually merge a piece of code. We can, uh, you know, require multiple reviewers to uh, have reviewed it and, um, uh, you know, said that, uh, you know, given their plus two if they're committers. Um, we can also integrate you know, requirements that uh, the build pass, you know, the build and the tests, we can articulate different paths of testing, you know, so we can have smoke tests and we can have, you know, the full integration tests and so forth. Um, and, you know, they, they've they got, the other, the other, you know, value here is that it, it basically can also ensure all of the, the legal aspects in terms of Making sure that everybody signed the DCO. I, I mean, I've got a bot right now for the fabric that does an okay job, but it's actually not checking on the merge as to whether or not the DCO has been signed off. Uh, it's just checking it on the actual pull request event. Um, so, so there's a number of things, and so uh, I think you know, Garrett is is definitely something that we need to be working towards. Um, uh, now, you know, the, the trick, of course, becomes that if you adopt Garrett, then that means we are essentially turning off all commits to GitHub uh, except via Garrett itself uh, because uh, only Garrett, basically the source of truth becomes Garrett and not GitHub. Uh, GitHub is just a, a mirror of what Garrett is maintaining. Um, but this means that basically, <laughs> and it, 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 it can sort of cascade. So then that means, well, okay, so then you can't do issue tracking using GitHub. Um, and that means we'll have to either, you know, adopt one of the, the tools that the Linux Foundation can run, which is either Jira or Bugzilla. Um, I think on the call, most of the people that were there seemed to express a preference for Jira, um, but they're roughly equivalent. But, the, you know, again, the, the Linux team has, uh, uh, you know, great integration between Jira, Garrett, um, and Slack and so forth already sort of in the can. Um, and, uh, and then we explored, okay, so then what would it take to migrate all the issues out of GitHub into JIRA? And apparently there is full automation for that. Um, and it should be fairly, fairly uh, straightforward and, and uh, not very complex. We could probably do it very quickly. Um, uh, the Linux Foundation team, uh, Andrew and team, basically made also a strong recommendation for use of Jenkins. I know that the Fabric team has been using Travis. Um, uh, and, but again, that's that's a fairly new development. Uh, the, the the problem with Travis, of course, is that it's free, and so therefore we don't really get support. <laughs> uh, we could pay for it, but um, we're also since we're already going to be paying the Linux Foundation for uh, the tooling, uh, you know, they can support Jenkins twenty four seven, um, and they operate it. They can scale it, and they've again they've got the experience for running a number of different projects. Um, so they did a really good sell job that we probably should be transitioning to Jenkins. And of course, the other aspect that was important is that Sawtooth Lake is already using Jenkins. And so uh, one of the two projects was, you know, incubating projects was going to need to make a change. And, um, and uh, since the, you know, since they did such a great job of selling Jenkins, it looks like it'll be that we'll have to tra migrate the Travis scripting over to Jenkins, which that really shouldn't be too hard. Um, uh, you know, and, and again, we really do need to make sure that we're driving towards a consistent set of tooling. So I think working on the Garrett Jenkins Jira path, and actually, I, I don't remember Dan if you had a, a concern. I don't think you had a concern about using Jira um, uh, for, for Sawtooth Lake, but um, and then finally, uh, you know, they they sort of also made a pitch that you know because we're going to be using multiple repositories. Um, you know, with the Fabric API and the Fabric and with multiple repositories for Sawtooth Lake, that it probably would be in our best interest to actually start 
a full release integration, release engineering function, uh, not just continuous integration, but you know, a full release engineering aspect, and and uh, actually have a full time Linux uh, foundation staffer uh, manning manning that um, uh, formally, and I think that was uh, also I think a great idea, and then finally. Um, there was the, the the wiki, and so I think we have to do a little bit of exploration as to whether or not we can continue to use the GitHub wiki once everything gets locked down uh, and run through Garrett. Um, uh, if we do, then we'll have to explore whether you use MediaWiki or one of the other popular um, wiki tools. Uh, but again, Git, uh, the, the the Linux Foundation team has experience running those as well, so I don't think. That'll be a problem. It'll be a little bit disruptive as we move things over, but um, I think for the most part, um, this is likely to be the, the plan going forward, and, and I'm hoping that maybe we can make a little bit of progress with this um, at the hackathon. So that's my update. Any questions? comments, concerns. If not, I think we're at end of job. I look forward to seeing many of you uh, at the hackathon. Um, and uh, I think we're adjourned. Hey, thanks, Chris. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.